Let's start out with this question. Who leads you? Who are you led by? I think there's different ways we can answer that question. We could maybe just say, well, who's the president of the United States right now? Or we could say, who's your boss? Who do you follow? Who, or maybe like, who's your mentor? Here's another way you could to look at answering this question. Who do you listen to the most? Who do you spend the most time listening to? I think that will help us to understand maybe who is influencing you so much that you would say you're being led by them. I wonder, who's America listening to? Because I think whoever you listen to the most is probably the person who is leading you. For Americans, the most watched news source currently is Fox News. And the most watched program on Fox News is a show called Tucker Carlson Tonight. In May, nearly three million people tuned in each night to watch Tucker. We could say that Tucker Carlson has a leading voice in America, speaking to and influencing millions. Now, whether or not you watch that program, you are listening to someone, you are being influenced by something. You are being led. And I wonder, are you being led to where you want to go? Or are you being led to where someone else wants you to go? I ask you again, who is leading you? The other day, I uh, opened up my phone, pulled out this little taskmaster of mine, and uh, I get these notifications, and uh, this interesting notification, these, these series of notifications showed up. And as I looked at the different things that I was being notified about, I just thought, man, what an interesting contrast. So I, I, I snapped a screenshot, and I, I just want to show it to you. Here's what, here's what came up. Let me, let me read, read to you what, what's on here. So a Fox News notification, I like most of Americans, apparently watch Fox News. It says, fully vaccinated people are still dying from COVID. How does this happen? That's a, that's a pretty basic question. We know that vaccines aren't a fail-safe. We know how this happens. Or uh, the New York Times. I also read the New York Times. I have a subscription to that uh, news source. It says, the U.S. often aids white disaster victims more than those of color, even when damage is similar. And research shows the disparity is sweeping. I also got a notification from NPR. NPR says, uh, not sure how to ask someone's pronouns or what different terms are. This is your guide about gender identity and why it matters. Three very different headlines. Now, I think I am a skeptic by nature. I think it's part of the reason that my faith is so solid is because I spent so much time being skeptical of the faith. Like, Jesus really had to win me over. And I look at this, and I, I also, my, my skepticism raises up. And you know, what I, you know what my first reaction is? Of course, these are the headlines from these different sources. I get all skeptical about it, and I start pointing out agendas. But I think a lot of people do, and we, know, we all know that even though Fox News is one of the most watched news sources, it's also one of the most ridiculed in our culture. People would look at Fox News, they're going to say, I see the agenda here. They're trying to scare people out of getting the vaccine. You know what? I think, I think we're right to say there's an agenda behind any message being brought to us. But if you only see an agenda here and you don't see it anywhere else, you could be already influenced, being led to where someone else wants you to go and maybe not where you want to go. For me, this, this screenshot really was just like that wake-up call of me asking myself, who, who really is leading me? Who is leading me? I, I mean, here's the point of today's message, and here's the agenda that I'm going to share with you, because I hope, hopefully you hear from me, I want the best for you. I don't want you to go anywhere other than where God wants you to go, and I think that is ultimately, eternally, a wonderful place to be. So today we're going to talk about being led by God. As we continue our sermon series by God, I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. I believe that's on page 1255 if you want to use the Bibles around you. And as you're turning there, let me just say this. I'm not saying the facts of these news stories, I'm not saying that they're not true. 
But of all the things that are happening in all the world, it's very interesting what is chosen to be presented to us. Because here's the reality. You know this as much as I do. We are led by headlines. We get so many notifications. I don't know if you saw that, but I had like 14 other notifications that I didn't click on. The reason I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this up to you, the church, is because I am fearful that we are being led by headlines. I'm, being, I'm fearful that we don't have the discerning heart and the ear of wisdom to take the proper truth and to discern the agenda behind things. Christians, we are given the word of God to help us to understand the world around us. And if we're going to be led by God, it starts by doing this. So, here's a little context for you as we read our passage. Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote this letter. And it's very clear as you read this letter, Paul loves the Thessalonians. See, he writes to the Thessalonians in a little city called Thessalonica. Today, we still have that city, except today it's called Thessaloniki. Paul plants this church in Thessalonica, and later on he writes back to them. That's why it's called the letter to the Thessalonians. And in this letter, you're going to see Paul's deep love for them, but you're also going to see some conflict that Paul has in his soul over these people. Thessalonica was a prominent city, the most prominent city in a region called Macedonia, which we now call Northern Greece. And so as we read this, I want you to pick up on, on where Paul is at at a heart level for these people. So would you hear the word of the Lord? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker, in the gospel to establish and exhort your faith, that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we were destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass, and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Our labor of planting the church, that is. Verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought to us good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, for this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may God, our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints. This is God's word, everyone. Let's pray and let's get started. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for this morning. And we pray for the praise of your name, that you would grant us understanding by your Holy Spirit, that he may inform our hearts and he may equip our souls with the truth of your word today, that we would respond rightly. We'd have a wise and loving and discerning ear. Father, we do pray that you would lead us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. 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 So let's skip the formalities here and let's just dig right in and see what the Lord has for us today. Church, I want you to be ready with an open heart and a listening ear because I believe the Lord may have something for you today. I don't know what it is, but I want you to be ready for it. So let's just dive right in. Paul goes back. Let's go back to verse 1. Paul writes, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind in Athens. Athens was about 300, give or take, miles south of Thessalonica. And as we talked about before, when Paul and his company, when they enter into the city and when they plant the church— it doesn't take very long before there's a major upheaval. The church stirs up problems there, or at least people bring problems to the church. 
Immediately there's a riot. There's an uproar. The city officials are brought in. Immediately the church is birthed in affliction. So much so that they actually make Paul and company leave. They're like, you guys got to get out of here. It's, it's turning bad. So Paul and company, they make a quick exit during the night. But Paul's heart is just tied to these people. And so while they leave, he's writing back because he misses them. He wants to see them. Paul loves this church. And so he says, when we could bear it no longer. Later on, he says, when I could bear it no longer. I needed to find out how you guys were doing. So we sent Timothy back to see how you guys, how you guys are. Because the church was facing affliction. They left in the midst of major opposition from their city. I mean, listen to these opening sections if you were listening here. Verse 3, the beginning of verse 3, he wants to make sure that no one's moved by these afflictions. The second half of verse 3, he says, you know that we were destined for this. This didn't happen by accident. Those who follow Christ were going to face opposition. Verse 4, he says, we kept telling you while we were there that we were going to suffer affliction. This should be no surprise to you guys. But Paul talks about a very real fear that he has. He's scared that affliction would open the door for the tempter, meaning the devil, to come in and to steal away their faith. So Paul's like, I need to know how you guys are doing. Because he knows affliction is the real deal. But here's the question. If, If Christianity is so good, why do we suffer affliction? And why are we destined for it? If Christianity is so good, why do we suffer affliction? You know, I think a lot of Christians suffer affliction. They suffer pain because they are not following God's leading. They are following their own path. They're following the ways of the world and what is acceptable to our culture and our society. And they are led down that path, and so they will suffer for their choices, which lead them away from God. But I'm not talking about that sort of suffering. I'm talking about for those of us who genuinely, truly, righteously want to follow God. We're willing to stand against culture and be called all sorts of terrible names. Why do do we suffer affliction? Well, let me give you some... Some reasons. Because good things are worth standing up for, and that's unpopular. That's unpopular in our day to say things that the culture at large does not agree with. Because we are to be like Jesus himself, who himself suffered for what was right. We're meant to be like Christ. What did he do? He gave up his life for us. Why do we suffer affliction? Because the world is opposed to this message. I was engaged with a friendly conversation with this guy, and he he said this to me. He said, Christian, I gotta make sure I said this right. He said that Christianity preaches a false disease and a false cure. Meaning we we talk about sin, which he does not believe in. And because we talk about sin, we talk about our need for a savior, Jesus dying on the cross for us. He said, false cure, false disease. The world is opposed to this message. Nobody likes to hear that they're a sinner in need of a savior. Why? Because this broken world has yet to be made new. Because we know that sin reigns in this world. And we know that God is going to make all things new. See, Christians, we say this is not how it's meant to be. Like, we know that there's an end in sight, and it's beautiful and glorious, but if you don't have that, then you can't say, you cannot say, this is not how it's meant to be. All you can say is, well, this is how it is. But we say, this is not how it's meant to be. And because we say, this is not how it's meant to be, because things are broken, we suffer affliction. So Paul sends Timothy to see what's happening, and Timothy returns with some good, with some good news. He says, but now what Timothy has come to us from you, and he's brought to us the good news of your faith and your love and reported that you, were mind, that you are mindful of us, you long to see us, we long to see you. And this is why, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through our faith. These couple passages here remind us, and I'll give you a big phrase here. They remind us of our communal nature of our faith. And what I mean is that a strong faith helps to build up other people's faith. We get encouraged and inspired when we see people champion the faith. So I'm going to ask you, who in your life has a faith in Jesus that inspires you? 
Who do you look to and you say, man, their faith is just so strong. It just fills me up. Does anybody have somebody like that in their life? Let me see. So here's what I want. I see a lot of hands raised right now. Maybe it's in our venues, online. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Would you let them know that? Build them up. Just say, your faith in Jesus, it really inspires me. It builds me up. It comforts me. We need to have this communal nature that we share this, that we're not meant to do this church thing all by ourselves. We're meant to be in community and we're meant to be in friendship and fellowship with one another. Please let them know if you are encouraged by them. And this is why we say that being in community with other Christians is critical to our faith. We're not meant to walk the faith alone. We're meant to walk the faith with a body of believers. And we also need to be setting the example for each other as we encourage and challenge each other to a deeper faith. The Apostle Paul, the most prominent writer of the New Testament, the greatest church planner of all time, he was encouraged by other people's faith. That should tell us a lot about what another person's faith can do for us. Because listen to what he says. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. Fast just means like firm. Some translations will really try to bring the emphasis out of what Paul is saying. So some, some translations will, will nuance this and they'll say, for now we really live if you are standing fast in the Lord. Because Paul looks at what's happening. They're, they're facing affliction. They're standing up for their faith and people are hating them for it. They're standing strong and Paul's inspired. He looks, he says, man, now we're really living. You guys are holding strong to the word of God. You guys are standing strong in your faith. Man, now we are really, really living. I want you to think about a time. Think about some memories. Pull out the Rolodex. Flip through. Think about a time when you said to yourself, man, now this is really living. Pull up that file. What was going on in your life? When you could just sit back and say, man, now this is really living. I asked a handful of people of that question this week. Just, I won't bring up names, and I didn't tell them why I was asking. But you want to know, like, the most overarching thematic answer was to that question? They were on vacation. <laughs> they were on some beach or some cruise, kicking it back. And they said, man, now this is really living. Life was found relaxing on a beach or on a cruise. And what I thought at this point was, um, for so many people, really living was found elsewhere. Like, I don't, I don't know what you're doing on a daily basis, but real life, really living was found elsewhere. But look at the contrast here. Paul says, we live if you are standing firm, fa standing fast in the Lord. The joy of, the joy and the meaning of Paul's life was found in seeing his mission fulfilled in the lives of others. To see them standing strong in the Lord just filled him up. He said, man, I am really living. Paul gave his life to see others come to know Christ. And the joy and the completeness of his life was found in seeing that happen. It's very exposing to us, isn't it? I mean, it really calls us out, doesn't it? For what we say is really living versus what Paul says is really living. And you wonder why we're still reading from him 2,000 years later, but the rest of us, our memories will be long gone in 2,000 years. Because Paul knew what life was actually about, and he lived it. We live our lives trying to find an escape to life so we can find life. So many people miss their life because they are missing the grand mission that God has given us on a daily basis. I mean, parents, right? Parent, parents, like we get up and what's one of the first things we think? Okay, got to get the kids up and ready for the day. What a small view of life. Parents, get up and say, I get to raise my kids today. I get a mission I get to raise the future leaders of this world. I get up and I get to raise 
my kids today, or maybe you're not a parent, whatever it is, get up and say, I get to live God's mission for my life today and then live out that mission and really live. You may say, Pastor, that sounds all fine and dandy, but I don't know my mission. I'm glad you're here. Stay with me and let's keep reading. Paul, being so full of life, he goes on to say, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? This is too good. For all the joy that we feel for your sake because of our, uh, before our God, and we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face. I mean, Paul almost sounds giddy here. Paul plants this church in Thessalonica. It's a, birth that is, it's a church that's birthed in suffering and affliction and a riot because the world's been opposed to this message since day one. But yet they are growing in their faith despite this, despite the difficulty, and it results with Paul having an over, jo- uh, overflowing joy. Church, give your life to something that when it goes well, you have joy. And when it doesn't go well, you still have purpose. And in that purpose, there is still joy. But I am here to tell you that is only found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The greatest, most grand purpose any person can be given is to live a life in light of, in response to the gospel, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that you may have life and have it eternally. And we are given that message and meant to share that message. And reminded here that Paul loves this church. He wants to see them face to face. Why? To supply what is lacking in their faith. Now, we could spend a lot of time on this, but what do you mean lacking in their faith? Well, I think Paul's mainly referring here to the numerous theological questions that they have, such as the return of Jesus Christ, what it means to truly live a holy life in a world that has a very different moral ethic. We're going to get into, Paul's going to get into this in the next two chapters, and that's what we're going to spend our time with in the next two weeks, so I hope you come back. But as he transitions in this letter into answering some of these particular theological points in the next two chapters, he first stops midway point in this letter, and he sort of like just stops, and before he gets into like some finer points of their questions, he just kind of blesses them like with this mid, mid-letter benediction encouragement. He says, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Hold on here. Of all the verses in this chapter, this is the gut punch for me. Why, Pastor Ryan? Seems like a pretty uh, non-insequential verse here. Well, I'll tell you why this this one really struck out to me. It's very clear now, at the end of, by the end of chapter 3, that Paul desperately loves these people. That he had to leave in the midst of affliction. He's worried about them. He longs to see them. He wants to see them. They want to see him. Paul, spend some time. Just, just go back, man. Go back and see them. But he doesn't. He says, may the Lord direct our path to you. Because Paul was willing to be led by God. Paul had every good reason to go see them. He had desire. They had a good reason to see him. He wanted to encourage their faith. He wanted to answer their theological questions. They longed to see him. They prayed for each other. Paul, just go see them for Pete's sake. But he won't do it unless the Lord leads him to do it. That was a man who was going to be led by God over and above his own personal desires. And that is a word for somebody in here. We want God to baptize and sanctify our personal desires and we'll couch it underneath this vague notion that God is a God of love. God is the God of holiness and righteousness and he is the God who is in control, who directs our lives. And Paul, Paul is willing to submit himself to that. Paul's willing to submit himself to that. So he continues on here. He goes on. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all all of his saints. And with these verses, at the conclusion of chapter 3, Paul 
Paul is at the uh, midway point of his letter. And at this midway point, he does so with a call to love, a challenge to be rooted in holiness, and a hope as we long for the return of Christ. But here's the deal. I don't know how many people are in this room. I don't know how many people are watching this or, or will listen to this later. But I know for however many different ear, set of ears are listening, like, we all have a different path. God's all going to lead us down a different journey, and all of our lives are going to look uh, very different. But if it's the same God who is leading us all, then I have to imagine there's going to be some similarities between our lives. And I think Paul just underscores those three things. No matter what you are called to do in life, no matter where you are called to go, if you are led by God, I think there's going to be three common denominators across the board for all of us. Paul just underscored them here. Love, holiness, and hope. A call to love, a call to holiness, and a call to greater, greater hope. Whatever you do in life, if you are led by God, you, you will be led into greater love, holiness, and hope. So our junior high trip uh, group just left this morning on their West Virginia trip. Pastor Travis prayed for them. We continue, we ask that you continue to pray for them, that God would keep them safe and really deepen their faith. Uh, Junior high is an incredibly formative time for a person's faith development. So we're excited to send them off for a great experience. My daughter, my oldest daughter, was part of that part of that trip. It's an important trip for eighth graders. It's kind of their last trip as a junior higher before they head off to high school. And as I waved goodbye to her, it was ever again that reminder that uh, my oldest daughter is going to be in high school next year. (laughs) My my oldest daughter is going to be in high school next year. (laughs) Thank you. I'm glad somebody's excited because I am freaked out. Ah, oh, man, I'm just kidding. I mean, I led high school for many, many, many years. High school is a wonderful time, <clears throat> right? Um, I mean, she's going to learn to drive. She's going to get her uh, first job, uh, college prep, if that's where she wants to go. Um, what other great things are part of? Oh, yeah, boys. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. You said you're praying. Thank you. You know, we, we take discipleship of our kids pretty seriously in the Kimmel house. We want to raise them in the knowledge of the Lord and the love of the Lord. We don't want, we don't want uh, the Bible to be seen as a rule book that keeps us from, from our great pursuits in life, but yet helps us to fulfill who God is calling us to be. And this is how we want to raise our kids. And yeah, we know how the world works. I myself was a high school boy at one time. And as we talk to our daughter and prep her for what will surely be a time that weighs on her emotionally, uh, we talk to her about the types of boys that mom and dad will one day uh, approve of her getting to know. (laughs) We talk about the type of guy that is worthy of her time, the type of guy that is worthy of her heart. And of course, for my oldest child, for my firstborn, for my daughter, of course we want the total package. And it's hard to settle for anything less. And for us, a man who is led by God is at the top of that list for us. And I will know that he is led by God if he has a life that is marked by love and holiness and hope. Holiness Holiness means to be set apart. Love, of course, is this agape love, love that, that is, is bound up in God, right? That love abounds in his life, a love marked by uh, a love for God and, and love towards others. And if he truly loves God, then he'll love the things of God, and that calls us to a deeper level of holiness. Holiness doesn't mean perfect. Holiness just means that we are set apart, that we are distinguished, that God calls us out as his own. Right? And as we, as a family, as we talk about our standard 
of holiness and our call for godliness, if some boy responds with an eye roll or some sort of response that, well, people just don't act like that anymore, or that's just not how things are, I'm sorry, those are not the words of someone who is holy. Those are the words of someone who is worldly. No boy better become knocking on the door of my house, wanting to take out my daughter, who looks to the world for his standard of right and wrong. You want to take my daughter out, you got to pass my test while she's still under my care. And you will look to the word of God and you will be pursuing holiness because that is what God calls us to. That's what God leads us to and it's better than the things of the world. I want the best for my daughter and I want to know that you're going to lead her to someplace great and the world's not going to take you there but the Lord will. To be led by God is to be distinct from this world and then there is hope. Our grand hope, our great grand hope as Christians is the return of Jesus Christ. It's knowing that all of this, in fact, does lead to something. It does lead to somewhere. It's just not going to be like this forever, continuing to waffle as a culture, trying to figure out what's right and wrong. Like this all is culminating in the return of Jesus Christ. This is our great hope that we long for. Paul points to the Thessalonians. He points to the Thessalonians to this, to love and to holiness, but he points them to the focus of our hope, and that is the return of Jesus, the return of our King. Paul gets into this with some detail in the next chapter, and so, we, so will we next week. But I'm afraid that Christians are not listening to the voices that grow us in love and holiness and hope. We're listening to the voices that continue to divide us. We're listening to the voices that continue to confirm our bias. We're listening to voices that raise our anxiety rather than our hope. And so you know what I think? I think this summer, it's time to turn this off. And it's time to open up this. Amen. If you do that with an open heart and a listening ear, the Spirit will speak through the Word and lead you to where God wants you to go. Church, let's follow Him. Amen. Let's stand. Would you please pray with me as we prepare our hearts? Lord God, we need you. Oh Lord, we need you every hour. We need you this hour. Lord, it is hard enough to live the life you're calling us to live. Lord, we need you even to help us worship you. We need you to lead and guide us. Lead and guide your church. We need you to help us to learn to forgive and to love again. Lord, call your church into a greater knowledge of your word that we may be led by the truth that you've placed before us, that we would be led by the power of the Spirit into a greater, greater experience of his presence. Thank you, Lord, for giving your Son to die for us. Thank you, Lord, for giving your Spirit to lead and guide us. And Lord, we know that we cannot do this without you. And so, Lord, we need you. Oh, we need you every hour. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, let's sing together. Amen.